Hi students and welcome to the next lecture in part 3 on translation. In the previous lecture, we spoke about how translation is initiated. In this lecture, we will discuss the concepts of translation elongation and termination. As we have discussed before, the start codon has a sequence of AUG and a transfer RNA containing CAU containing methionine will bind to the start codon. What this tells us is that all proteins should begin with a methionine residue. However, some genes have been shown to have a CUG or GUG sequence instead of the AUG sequence. In these genes, a transfer RNA containing methionine or CAU can still bind to the start codon. And this is due to the fact that the CUG or the GUG sequence is located within the consensus sequence that fit COSAC's rules. However, in some cases, the amino acid corresponding to a start codon that has CUG instead of AUG would be CAG. And this corresponds to leucine. Therefore, some polypeptide chains can begin with a leucine instead of a methionine. However, for the purpose of our lectures, we will always consider AUG and methionine as the start codon and initiated transfer RNA. We'll now start discussing the process of translation elongation in detail. Elongation requires two ribosomal binding sites. The initiated transfer RNA, methionine, will bind to the start codon and occupy the P site in the large ribosomal subunit. The RNA that corresponds to the next codon, in this case the next codon is CUG, and the corresponding amino acid and transfer RNA is leucine, will bind at the A site or the amino site. This transfer RNA is recruited to the ribosome by an elongation factor called EEF1. Due to the structure of the ribosome, only two transfer RNAs can be bound to an mRNA strand at the same time. These two transfer RNAs are also bound to adjacent three base sequences on the mRNA strand. When two transfer RNAs are bound at the A and the B sites, the large ribosomal subunit can catalyze the formation of a peptide bond between the neighboring amino acids. Once this peptide bond is catalyzed, EEF2 or elongation factor 2 moves the ribosome along the mRNA strand. When the ribosome moves along the mRNA strand, the next transfer RNA leucine will move into the P site. At the same time as this transfer RNA moves to the P site, the initiated transfer RNA dissociates from the ribosome. Again, this is due to the ribosomal structure, which means that only two transfer RNAs can bind to neighboring sequences on the mRNA at the same time, and these have to be located in the A and the P sites. So due to the fact that the initiator codon is no longer bound to the RNA strand, it is released from the ribosome. This results in a peptide bond between methionine and leucine and an empty A site in the ribosome. Another transfer RNA containing the appropriate amino acid in this case, the codon is a triple G and the corresponding amino acid is a glycine, will be recruited to the ribosome by EEF1 again. 
So the next amino acid and transfer RNA will then occupy the A site within the large ribosomal subunit. And then the large ribosomal subunit will catalyze the formation of a peptide bond between these two neighboring amino acids. And this is how the process of elongation now begins, and it will continue in this way in a sequential manner. The polypeptide chain therefore gets gradually built up in this process. And this results in the information from the mRNA being translated into proteins according to the genetic code. Once this peptide chain has fully formed, translation must be terminated in order for the peptide chain to be released from the ribosome. Termination occurs at a specific codon or three base pair sequence called a stop codon. And this stop codon usually has the sequence UAA, UAG, or UGA. These stop codons cannot be recognized by transfer RNA due to the fact that they do not code for any specific amino acid. So once the last codon bound by a specific transfer RNA in the amino acid encounters the stop codon, a release factor called ERF1 will then bind to the stop codon. The release factor does not contain an amino acid at its three prime end, but instead contains a water molecule. The ribosome will then catalyze a bond between the last amino acid in the peptide chain to a water molecule. And this results in the formation of a carboxylic acid at the end of the polypeptide chain and release of this polypeptide from the ribosome. After the ribosome catalyzes the bond between the release factor, the ribosome will then shift to the next position. Again, the transfer RNA is released that was originally in the P site due to the fact that it will move to the E site. And at the same time, the polypeptide chain becomes released from the ribosome. Interestingly, release factors have also been shown to bind in the absence of a stop codon. These release factors may bind to the A site if an incorrect tRNA has been incorporated at the P site. And therefore, ribosomes also have a certain amount of proofreading capabilities due to the presence of the release factor. Now, as I've mentioned before, eukaryotic mRNAs are monosystronic, which means that each mRNA codes for a single protein. However, a single mRNA can be translated into multiple copies of the same protein due to the fact that many ribosomes can bind to a single mRNA at the same time. In this structure, we see what's called a polyribosome. A polyribosome means that many ribosomes are bound to the same mRNA. In addition to many ribosomes being bound, although we've shown it in a linear fashion in previous slides, the mRNA can take on a circular structure. This is due to the fact that a poly A tail binding protein, PAPB, can interact with the eukaryotic initiation factor 4G that is associated with the 5' prime cap. Due to this interaction, this promotes a circular structure of mRNA containing multiple ribosomes. This allows for efficient translation of many copies of the protein as once the ribosome encounters the stop codon, the ribosome can very quickly dissociate from the stop codon and reinitiate a new round of translation of that mRNA by binding to the 5' prime cap, which is in very close proximity to the 3' prime poly A tail. And so these polyribosomes may be present when translation of a protein has to be very efficient. So this brings us to the end of this lecture. In the next lecture, we will now discuss how mRNAs can be degraded after they are translated. Thank you.